Hi everyone, welcome back to Mad Barn Academy. And if you're new here, welcome. We hope to earn your subscription today. If you like this video and other videos that we post, please like and subscribe. As always, we really appreciate the ongoing support. I'm Dr. Fran Rowe, one of the veterinary nutritionists here at Mad Barn. Today, I'm covering part one of a two-part series on equine laminitis. Most horse owners recognize laminitis as a serious threat to their horse's health and well-being. Laminitis is both a common disease and a debilitating disease, which is why it really stays kind of at the top of the charts in terms of topics that interest both horse owners and researchers. Our team encounters questions about laminitis probably daily, which is why we've dedicated a lot of time to generating resources for, for horse owners on this topic. I've linked several of our articles about laminitis in the comment section below, so feel free to check those out after today's video. All right, well, without further ado, let's get started on today's presentation, which is an overview of laminitis. So, Today, we're covering part one of this two-part series. Be sure to check back for part two in the coming uh, week or two, where I'll be discussing endocrinopathic laminitis specifically. Okay, so I think we're all familiar with the, or the phrase, no hoof, no horse, because it's so true. Laminitis is the most serious disease of the equine foot, and it's probably the second biggest killer of horses behind colic. It's estimated that between 10, maybe 15% of horses in the United States are afflicted by laminitis at some point in their lifetime. And up to 75% of those horses that are affected eventually develop severe or chronic lameness and debilitation. So what is laminitis exactly? By definition, it's inflammation, itis, of the lamina in the foot. The lamina are these finger-like projections that arise from the coffin bone and from the internal hoof capsule, and then they link together. You can sort of think of it like Velcro. The lamina, which can also be called lamellae, just to make things extra confusing, suspend that coffin bone within the hoof capsule. And this suspensory or lamellar apparatus of the equine foot is, is a highly dynamic structure. It's incredibly strong, essentially able to carry the weight of the horse, um, while also being incredibly flexible. It has to be able to, to compress and stretch and tolerate these really extreme biomechanical forces applied to the foot during normal movement or, um, or uh, accelerated movement like exercise. So here's a graphic illustrating the basic structure of the equine hoof. There's a lot going on in this graphic, so you might find it helpful to pause the video at this point so that you can kind of take an extra moment to study these structures and read all of the little labels. For right now, I simply want to highlight uh, the lamina specifically. So the, derm the dermal lamina or lamellae arise from the surface uh, of the coffin bone. The epidermal lamina or lamellae arise from the innermost layer of the hoof capsule, the stratum internum. Together, they interdigitate or link together. And we can also break down the lamina into uh, primary and secondary structures. I sort of think of it like a bottle brush where the primary lamina are the, are the handle of the brush and then the secondary lamina are all those bristles that extend off of the brush handle. And what this does is increase the surface area of the lamina where they link together, making that bond exceptionally strong. And this is exactly what it looks like under the microscope. And this histopathic image here, the darker pink tissue 
are the epidermal lamina, while the lighter pink tissue is the dermal lamina. The asterisk is labeling the primary lamina, which is the handle to our bottle brush, and the arrows are labeling the secondary lamina, which would be the bristles coming off the brush. Okay, so now that we have a little bit better understanding of the structure that's actually affected by laminitis, the lamina or lamellar apparatus of the foot, what happens when there is inflammation present? Basically, laminitis results in damage to the lamina. Inflammation weakens the bond between the hoof capsule and the coffin bone by destroying the structure and integrity of that Velcro. This leads to instability, which we understand to be extremely painful. That's why horses with laminitis are so debilitated. The degree of damage and instability can certainly range from very mild to catastrophic and life ending. Now, one distinction that I think is worth making at this point is between laminitis and founder. It's common for these terms to be used interchangeably. However, they're technically not quite the same thing. Founder describes displacement of the coffin bone within the hoof capsule specifically. Not all episodes of laminitis or inflammation of the foot result in coffin bone displacement, though certainly severe or chronic lamellar instability increases this likelihood. There are two types of displacement, rotation and sinking. Rotation is probably the more common, and it occurs when the coffin bone is kind of pulled away from the dorsal hoof wall by the deep digital flexor tendon. The DDFT is always exerting tension on the coffin bone, but under normal circumstances, that strong lamellar bond keeps the coffin bone in place. When that bond is weakened, that normal force of tension is able to displace the coffin bone. Sinking is, uh, is exactly what it sounds like. It's when the coffin bone actually sinks deeper into the hoof capsule due to really severe laminar breakdown kind of uh, globally around the entire foot. When catastrophic failure occurs, the coffin bone can actually rupture through the sole, uh, which is fatal. So here's a simple graphic illustrating the difference between a healthy foot and a foot with laminitis. To review, there's inflammation of the lamina, which results in separation between the hoof wall and the coffin bone. If severe enough, the coffin bone can rotate or sink. Over time, we'll also be able to appreciate abnormal hoof growth, uh, widening of the white line on the sole, and changes to kind of the normal hoof angle um, and, and the heel. Under the microscope, this is what laminitis can look like. So the inset image is of normal lamina at the same magnification for comparison. As we can see, laminitis causes a breakdown of that normal lamellar structure. The lamina really start to stretch and elongate, and there's failure of those epithelial cell adhesions that, that keep that bond together. Abnormal islands of ap epidermal tissue will also form, which can become excessively cornified or basically excessively hardened, kind of like the exterior of the hoof wall, uh, contributing to formation of the lamellar wedge uh, in the space created by separation. And then the clefts or gaps caused by that lamellar separation will fill with serous exudate or hemorrhage. And these pockets, as well as necrotic or dead laminar tissue, creates the perfect environment for bacteria to thrive. 
This is why horses with labonitis are often plagued with secondary hoof abscesses um, when they're acutely laminitic. So here I wanted to show the two types of founder or displacement of the coffin bone within the hoof capsule. In a normal hoof, which is A, the dorsal surface of the coffin bone is parallel to the dorsal hoof wall, as illustrated by those two green lines. When the coffin bone rotates, it pulls away from the dorsal hoof wall, and you can appreciate that those lines are no longer parallel. When the coffin bone sinks, one of the most apparent changes that um, kind of we'll be able to note is the formation of this kind of cleft at the coronary band, which is denoted by the arrow in the um, image uh, on the bottom right. As the bony column essentially sinks um, into the foot, that coronary band is also pulled down and it creates this cleft or this dip. So, we used to think that laminitis was a disease kind of in and of itself. However, researchers now agree that it is actually a consequence associated with some sort of systemic disease process happening in the horse. As it turns out, laminitis is actually quite, com uh, quite a complex disease process, and there's still a ton of research being done on the different mechanisms of laminitis and how they differ from one another. But at present, we have accepted three main mechanisms for laminitis. Metabolic associated or endocrinopathic laminitis, sepsis induced or endotoxemic laminitis, and mechanical overload laminitis. Endocrinopathic laminitis is associated with metabolic disorders that result in elevated blood insulin levels or hyperinsulinemia, such as equine metabolic disease or uh, PPID, Cushing's disease. Endotoxemic laminitis is associated with some sort of massive inflammatory event that results in severe body-wide inflammation, such as sepsis or SIRS. Examples include enterocolitis, um, pleuromonia, retained placenta. Um, additionally, exposure to black walnut falls under this category, though um, this kind of causes a more localized severe inflammation rather than body-wide. Lastly, mechanical overload laminitis is associated with excessive concussion or excessive weight bearing, which ends up impairing blood flow to the foot. Examples include road founder or excessive concussion on hard surfaces like asphalt and support limb laminitis, which occurs when the animal is non-weight bearing for an extended period of time on one limb, and then therefore overloads um, the good foot and bears too much weight on that foot for too long. So we're gonna be focusing on endocrinopathic laminitis from here on out. Um, specifically for two reasons. First, it's the most common cause of laminitis. Uh, it's believed that 90% or more of horses that develop laminitis have an underlying metabolic disease to start with. And then secondly, it's the mechani mechanism of laminitis that we can actually address with dietary management, which will be covered in the part two video. So we'll wrap up today's presentation with a little bit of a deeper dive into the mechanism of endocrinopathic laminitis. As I mentioned, this is still a really active area of research, but at present we believe that there are two main ways that elevated blood insulin or hyperinsulinemia damages that lamellar bond in the foot. Firstly, insulin overstimulates growth factor receptors, which triggers epidermal proliferation. This causes the cells to stretch and lose their normal shape, 
ultimately decreasing the structure and structural integrity of that lamellar bond. Secondly, insulin triggers pathways that promote vasoconstriction or narrowing of the blood vessels in the foot. This results in ischemia of the tissues, meaning these tissues and cells don't get enough oxygen and nutrients. So certainly a massive hyperinsulinemic event can lead to acute laminitis, which has been demonstrated experimentally in healthy horses. Um, that's, that's how some of this research has been conducted. However, many horses with metabolic disease and subsequent chronic insulin dysregulation exhibit insidious or low-grade changes to the foot over time. These horses might not be overtly laminitic all the time, but ultimately these changes weaken the structural bond in the foot. What this means is that these horses are more susceptible to developing fulminant laminitis because they have exaggerated insulin reactions compared to normal horses, and the, that chronic damage is cumulative over time. When a horse suddenly becomes acutely laminitic, we can usually find the reason for it. All right, so remember in part two, we'll review um, metabolic disease as well as go over the clinical signs of laminitis, what to look for both for um, acute laminitis as well as those kind of chronic low-grade changes that you can um, take note of. And then lastly, we'll cover some prevention strategies. So be sure to check back in the next week or two for the part two. All right, so here are references for today. And thanks for listening. I hope you like this video. Please like and subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to check back um, and check out those additional resources that I've linked in the description below. All right, until next time, thank you.